Hey squad, today I want to look at the relationship of Sauron's power and the ruling ring. I've talked about the mechanics of all the rings of power before, in my longest video to date, which I'll link in the description, but in this video I'm approaching it from a slightly different angle. First I'm going to look at some common points of contention about the ring, and explain why talking about power can get so complicated despite, or maybe because of, Tolkien's attempts to clear up confusion. Then I'll explain how the unique degree to which Tolkien understood language makes it possible to pin down what he meant by certain important terms with a precision that's often not possible for the works of other writers. I'll show some ways to determine the meanings of those important terms by comparing the history of English words to the evolution of their elvish translations, or lack thereof, by examining how Tolkien uses words contextually in his fiction, and by looking at his more direct comments about words in his letters and essays. Finally, I'll apply this process to the use of the word power to not only make the purpose and use of Sauron's ring more logically coherent, but also to add to an appreciation of the story's themes. The novel The Lord of the Rings is about, well, a bad guy who is the lord over a bunch of magic rings. To defeat him, our protagonists have to destroy the Master Ring through which he controls the others, and into which a great deal of his own power has passed. In a sense, everything else is just window dressing. This deceptively simple premise is the core of the whole book. But if you try to get much more specific than that about Sauron and his ring, you run into layers of complication. Naturally, people have been asking questions about Sauron and his ring since the book came out. Tolkien did provide some additional details, both in letters to individual readers and in his own personal notes and essays. Alas, these arguably make the problem worse, and the quite reasonable desire to precisely understand the ring's power quickly leads to some lines of argument that even the most pedantic and zealous of us start to boggle at. For example, Sauron puts a lot of his power into the ring. That's why when the ring is destroyed, so is he. And it's also why, so long as the ring exists, he cannot be destroyed. Though it does seem he can be temporarily defeated, delayed, or weakened. That was the whole point of the Last Alliance, after all. One of the effects of the rings on their possessors is to enhance their natural powers. Does this then mean that Sauron, with the ring, is more powerful than he was before he forged it? Tolkien says in one letter to a prospective publisher that while he wore it, his power on Earth was actually enhanced. Which sounds a lot like he was indeed more powerful, but how would that work since the One Ring apparently gets its powers from the power Sauron put into it? How can Sauron's power enhance itself? What's the upper limit on that kind of thing? There are also a couple of potential qualifiers in that sentence. How do you define enhanced? Is it synonymous with increased? And if not, then what does it mean? Tolkien specifies it was Sauron's power on Earth that was so enhanced. But Sauron exists fully within Arda, so what other power would we be talking about? Does on Earth mean on Middle-earth? Would he be less enhanced if he put the ring on in Valinor? In the very next sentence of this letter, Tolkien says that even if he did not wear it, that power existed and was in rapport with himself. He was not diminished. Which seems hard to credit, because Tolkien just told us that Sauron has enhanced power when the ring is on his finger. Is diminished not the opposite of enhanced? In a later letter, Tolkien describes how after Numenor's destruction, despite possessing his ring the whole time, Sauron was of course confounded by the disaster and diminished, having expended enormous energy in the corruption of Numenor. He needed time for his own bodily rehabilitation and for gaining control over his former subjects. He was attacked by Gilgalad and Elendil before his new domination was fully established. The ring is still very much in existence, it's even in his possession, and yet here Tolkien describes Sauron as diminished. We also have to square all this with statements made in the actual novel. Gandalf tells Frodo, this is the one ring that he lost many ages ago to the great weakening of his power, which again sounds like diminishment to me. But on the other hand, we also know that by the end of the Third Age, Sauron's power has been increasing for a while, long before he or anyone even realized the ring still existed, much less that anyone had found it. How is it that Sauron's power has fluctuated so much over the past 3,000 years, when for most of that time the ring was lying quietly on the bottom of the Anduin? What does this ring even do? Does it enhance his power or not? Can he be diminished or can't he? 
Why does Sauron even want this thing back? Was Boromir right all along? These are the kinds of questions that arise when you examine how power functions in Tolkien's writings. The Rings of Power are some of the most obvious, most relevant, and arguably most needlessly complicated examples, but there are plenty of others. Where is the line drawn between Vingolfin's inability to defeat Morgoth and his ability to permanently wound him? In a world where power also represents vulnerability, what is the point of comparing, say, Galadriel to Sam Gamgee? And what are we to make of Tom Bombadil? There are two ways to approach this problem. The simplest option is to give up. You decide either Tolkien was making it all up as he went along, or, more generously, his ideas were evolving so quickly, and with such incomplete documentation, that it's pointless to try to apply any logic to the function of the rings or the relative abilities of different characters. The best approach is to swallow down any potential plot holes without complaint, and appreciate the tremendous artistic feats Tolkien was able to achieve. There is certainly justification for this stance. Tolkien himself objected that you cannot press the One Ring too hard, for it is, of course, a mythical feature. And Tolkien is notorious for his revisions, retcons, contradictions, and poor record-keeping. Even where he does attempt to explain some facet of his thought process, it's hard to tell if we're getting the whole story. So even if we allow that Tolkien did have some kind of underlying vision or unifying theory, it may not be possible to decipher it. This isn't terribly satisfying, and it's also an answer that Tolkien probably would have disliked. He spent a lot of time trying to ensure that his mythology was internally consistent and credible. This leads us to the second common response, which supposes that, whether or not Tolkien ever made it explicit, there is some underlying logic to how Middle-earth works, and it's worthwhile to try to reason it out. You can get pretty far with this approach. I've used it in a slew of videos myself. But its weakness is that it depends on a reader interpreting possible shades of meaning in certain terms and phrases. And it's very difficult to do that with any degree of objectivity. Language is contextual and to a degree relative, and this means it's usually all but impossible to know what precisely an author meant by a given word or phrase. Luckily for us, Tolkien is something of a special case. As is well known, he was a scholar of language. One of his particular interests was how the meanings of words could change over time, in response to factors like geography, culture, and political and social forces. This gave him a special awareness of what certain terms could mean, and moreover, of what he meant by them. He used words with an unusual degree of conscious intent. And this means there is a comparative wealth of objective evidence that we can use to narrow down Tolkien's likely meanings instead of relying solely on personal interpretations. This evidence can be drawn from his writings on his invented languages, his fiction, and his letters, commentaries, and essays. One place we see Tolkien's historical ear for words is the influence it had on his approach to inventing languages. He was careful to make sure each language's vocabulary was not merely a direct recreation of an existing language, but instead reflected the outlook of the people who spoke it. So Quenya and Sindarin not only had to make sense, give aesthetic pleasure, and fit their respective invented histories, they also had to convincingly reflect an inhuman perspective. To do this, he had to analyze some of the most basic assumptions about words that English speakers and arguably humans generally might have held. So his work on Quenya and Sindarin reveals a lot about how he approached important terms and ideas. Accordingly, we see that in the Elvish languages, some concepts that would map to a single English word are divided into separate terms, and likewise some concepts that English speakers would differentiate are lumped together by the elves. A good example of the former is the word hope which could be translated into Sindarin as either Amdir or Estel, Amdir referring to an externally based expectation that things would improve, Estel referring to something more like trust. There's no explicit discussion of these terms in The Lord of the Rings, but the distinction between the two possible senses of hope is latent in the very premise of the novel itself. Sending the ring into Mordor is absolutely an act of Estel over Amdir, and the struggle to hold on to Estel when Amdir has disappeared is played out over and over again. We need look no farther than the use, or rather uses, of the word hope in the scenes set during the Siege of Gondor. I defy anyone to find a character who uses the word hope as frequently as Denethor does in his madness. He's constantly making reference to how the fool's hope has failed, even though it's becoming more and more obvious that it is Denethor's hope, specifically his Amdir, that has failed failed him, his son, and his country. 
Gandalf and Pippin, who founded their hope not in Omdir but Estel, are in fact sustained by it as things get worse. To let the readers emotionally experience this difference is far more effective in this context than explicitly calling attention to it would be. Yet the added context of the Elvish translations shows just how thoroughly Tolkien had considered the uses and meanings of hope, and how clearly he distinguished between two of those meanings. An example where the elves do not make a distinction that is present in other languages is found in the English term magic, or to get super technical, whatever Westron term Tolkien is choosing to translate as magic. In my not at all comprehensive research, I could not find any single elvish word that could translate the sense of the English term magic. The closest we get is the Sindarin element ghoul, as in Morgul or Dol Guldur. Ghoul specifically refers to evil arts or sorceries. Generally speaking, though, feats that humans consider magical, the elves would call feats of great skill or knowledge. We know from comments Tolkien makes elsewhere that this attitude reflects his own feelings about art, magic, and machines. As in the case of Hope, the elvish perspective on magic is reflected in The Lord of the Rings, this time explicitly. In Lothlorien, Sam admits he's disappointed he hasn't seen more of what he calls elvish magic. It seems that even between hobbits, this term can mean different things, because Frodo says, you can see it and feel it everywhere. And Sam replies, well, you can't see nobody working it, no fireworks like poor old Gandalf used to show. Galadriel conveniently shows up at this moment to offer Sam a look in her mirror. For this is what your folk would call magic, I believe, though I do not understand clearly what they mean. And they seem also to use the same word of the deceits of the enemy. But this, if you will, is the magic of Galadriel. A little bit later, when Pippin asks if the elven cloaks they've been given are magic, an elf replies, I do not know what you mean by that. They are fair garments, and the web is good, for it was made in this land. They are elvish robes, certainly, if that is what you mean. The point of all this is not to show that Tolkien sometimes used a single word to mean slightly different things. You could say the same of virtually anyone who uses any language. The point is that he thought about just what those different shades of meaning were with unusual care and thoroughness. Thus, any attempt to understand what Tolkien meant by a particular term in a given passage must cultivate a similar awareness. So let's do just that by returning to our original example, the term power, particularly what can be said of the power of the ruling ring and its relationship to its creator. The English word power is derived from Latin words referring in their simplest sense to plain ability. By the time it gets filtered through French and ends up in English, the term already has several extended meanings, leaving aside for the moment the technical definition of power as a function of energy conversion over time. It can be used to mean ability, efficacy, authority or permission, physical force or strength, or a particular innate characteristic or ability. It's easy to see how these are all related, but it's also true that many of these senses can, in certain circumstances, become distinct, even in casual English use. For example, I could truly say that as a relatively able-bodied adult human, I have the power to run a marathon. That is, such a thing is possible for someone in my circumstances. But if you were to put me at the starting line and yell go, it would not be long at all before I collapsed in a heap of cardiovascular inadequacy. So I can also truthfully say that I don't have the power to run a marathon. Not currently. Not without time and training. In my inexpert research into the elven tongues, I found the opposite effect at work. As in the case of magic, there doesn't seem to be one single word with a truly comparable definition. Instead, there are multiple words, stemming from multiple origins, that can come to mean power, often a particular form of it. It's important to note that Tolkien revised his linguistic writings almost constantly, so my conclusions here should be treated less as a definitive final statement and more like a tentative observation of a broad trend. Nevertheless, I think these results are still useful. The element tour that shows up in words like tarambar can mean power in the sense of mastery or victory over someone or something. This is distinct from the word that means lordship or authority. The Quenya verb vala in its strict sense does simply mean to have power, but it becomes so closely associated with the valar, or powerful ones, that in practice it comes to refer more narrowly to the exercise of divine force. There is an element in the name Melkor that translates to power or might, but can also refer to great size. The words for beauty, artistry, and usefulness share tangled histories as befits the elvish perspective, 
but one extended sense of the word that means good, as in sound or usable, could be great or powerful, carrying with it the suggestion of power as a function of health or wholeness. These examples are not as clearly delineated as Amdir and Estel, but this diversity does suggest that the elves did not conceive of a single essential force or phenomenon of power that could encompass all the senses of the English term. Next, we must look at the word's use in Tolkien's fiction. Naturally, Tolkien had other words at his disposal, synonyms with their own histories and shades of meaning, like strength, might, domination, force, and greatness. He makes use of all of these, but power is a word of special significance. He identifies it as one of his primary themes, and he decides to name the most important magical devices of his novel the Rings of Power. Despite claiming in a letter that power is an ominous and sinister word in all these tales except as applied to the gods, he uses the word positively, negatively, and neutrally in The Lord of the Rings. Sauron has power, the rings are said to have powers, Glorfindel and others from Valinor have great power against the seen and unseen, plants have healing powers, there are dark powers, and powers for good. This is also directly commented on in the text. Gandalf mentions to Frodo and others on several occasions that there is more than one power at work in the world. Indeed, there is a power in Rivendell to withstand the might of Mordor, for a while, and elsewhere other powers still dwell. There is power, too, of another kind in the Shire. It's not so much a semantic difference he's pointing out, rather it's evidence that Gandalf, and therefore his author, recognized this single word could apply to many circumstances, and that there were different kinds of power in Middle-earth. In his letters, Tolkien speaks more directly about power, but he's still using the term fairly loosely, in a colloquial sense. This is fitting given the intended purpose and audience of most of his correspondence. Returning yet again to letter 131, we see Tolkien describe the rings of power as follows. The chief power of all the rings alike was the prevention or slowing of decay, but they also enhanced the natural powers of a possessor thus approaching magic, a motive easily corruptible into evil, a lust for domination. And finally, they had other powers more directly derived from Sauron. In the space of a couple sentences, we've been given at least three ways to understand the term rings of power. The rings have powers, innate abilities or functions, like a starfish's power of regeneration. They also act on the natural powers of the people possessing them. And then Tolkien mentions their tendency to increase the lust for domination, which is another reason you could call them rings of power. This is one of those instances where I suspect Tolkien would be not at all displeased by the layered meanings. Ambiguity can achieve some potent artistic effects. We see a more technical exploration of the meanings of power in Tolkien's private essays, especially those from later in his life. In his introduction to a collection of these, published under the heading Myths Transformed in the volume Morgoth's Ring, Christopher Tolkien notes, in these writings can be read the record of a prolonged interior debate. Tolkien was impelled to try to construct a more secure theoretical or systematic basis for elements in the Legendarium that were not to be dislodged. So while incomplete and ambiguous, these essays definitely give insight into the progression of Tolkien's attempt to systematize his world. In section 7, titled Notes on Motives in the Silmarillion, Tolkien muses on the relative power and powers of Sauron and Morgoth, and the differences in their exercise of power. The section starts with the claim that Sauron was greater, effectively, in the Second Age than Morgoth at the end of the First. Why? Because though he was far smaller by natural stature, he had not yet fallen so low. Eventually, he also squandered his power of being in the endeavor to gain control of others. Here, it appears that Tolkien is trying to distinguish between innate personal power of being and effective power or greatness. By one measure, Morgoth far exceeds Sauron, but by the other, Sauron is able to eclipse Morgoth. Later, Tolkien distinguishes between the exercise of power as a physical force and as mental domination. To gain domination over Arda, Morgoth had let most of his being pass into the physical constituents of the earth. Elves and still more men, Morgoth despised because of their weakness, that is, their lack of physical force or power over matter. Sauron, however, inherited the corruption of Arda and only spent his much more limited power on the rings, for it was the creatures of the earth, in their minds and wills, that he desired to dominate. A couple of pages later, he returns to the relationship between power of being and effective power. Morgoth lost, or exchanged, or transmuted the greater part of his original angelic powers of mind and spirit while gaining a terrible grip upon the physical world. 
though he had disseminated his power, his evil and possessive and rebellious will, far and wide into the matter of Arda, he had lost direct control of this, and all that he, as a surviving remnant of integral being, retained as himself and under control, was the terribly shrunken and reduced spirit that inhabited his self-imposed, but now beloved, body. Combining all these contexts starts to give us an idea of how Tolkien understood the various concepts he referred to as power. In contrast to the plethora of possible meanings the English word power and its synonyms can take on, Tolkien's invented languages seem to distinguish between these different senses. In his fiction and letters, he displays an awareness of how ambiguous the meaning of the word power can be, though he doesn't seem too anxious about any possible lack of clarity. And finally, we see his efforts to spell out how power can be used by his mightiest characters, in which he makes more explicit distinctions that are complemented by his use of the word in other contexts. The closest he gets to defining power as a single broad concept seems to be the idea of one's power of being, something like one's raw potential to affect the course of history. This can be translated into effective power over a particular domain. There seem to be several types of this, including the power to exert force over the physical or material world, and the power of domination over minds and wills. If the object of this exchange is particularly broad, for example, all of material existence, then the individual's personal power of being will be dispersed and pass out of their control. If, by contrast, the exchange is made narrowly, then the power will be concentrated, still under the individual's control, but less versatile in how it may be employed. This hypothetical understanding does a pretty good job of clearing up some of those earlier questions about how Sauron can use his ring. It would seem, for instance, that Sauron's lack of diminishment strictly applies to his power of being. His effective power will fluctuate based on factors that include, but are not limited to, his access to his ring. The emphasis on physical force versus mental domination explains why physically killing Morgoth is necessary to defeat him, but killing Sauron doesn't permanently affect him, whether he retains his ring or not. Morgoth's invested his power of being in the physical realm, where he is nigh invincible, but this means that if he is physically defeated, the consequences are significant. While Sauron also grows dependent on a body, he doesn't need one to exist or exert his will. He risks and suffers physical defeat pretty regularly. His dominance is mental and emotional. Of at least equal interest are the thematic implications of this understanding. Instead of seeing power as a single fixed attribute that can be accounted for with almost mathematical precision, we can see it as something that by definition is in flux, finite but not fixed. Every exercise of power is a form of exchange, and every decision about how and when to use it comes with its own consequences. Sauron putting his power into the ring, one of a set of objects designed to dominate, represents one such decision. It keeps him from losing control over his power at the cost of limiting what that power can be used for. It creates twin vulnerabilities. If the ring is destroyed, Sauron will become totally ineffectual. But more importantly, by committing all his power to domination, he's become blind to the possibility that anyone would try to destroy it. He cannot imagine such a thing because he's already traded away his capacity to conceive of the world in any terms other than those of domination and control. If we assume that to extend power in one area invites weakness in another, the ambiguity around the name Rings of Power takes on thematic weight. It seems that a Ring of Power does not increase its bearer's power of being, rather it transmutes this power into increased domination over others, at the cost of binding the bearer's power to that sole purpose, which eliminates the capacity for empathy, self-awareness, contentment, and repentance. The one power that can't be overcome by using the rings is the power the rings come to hold over their users. Even Sauron, the lord of the rings and master of all that is achieved through them, is a slave to his own devices. As Tolkien says, to master a ring of power is to be mastered by it. If you enjoyed this video, use the power of your mouse to transmute some of your might into the efficacy of a YouTube like. Subscribe for more opportunities to hear me succumb to base pedantry. I also have a Patreon with pretty sick bonus content that you might want to check out. There were a lot of extra examples and details about linguistics, word histories, Tolkien's writing style, and Sauron's power that I didn't have time to get to in this video, but I will definitely be releasing there. Thank you for watching, and special thanks to my patrons including Dorwin Gray, Allison Kreutzberg, Karen and Michael Donahue, John Love, Brendan Mooney, 
E. Rose B., Frankie Twelve String, Louis Maskell, Tamara Saldana, Luke, Kevin Gilstad, Joel Beyond, Rogue Hot Pocket, Elu Thickgoal, and Jared Carver. Until next time. <laughs>